Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the 19th and final Candidates Forum for the 2021 general elections in the Cayman Islands, being hosted by the Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce in association with Fosters. My name is Mike Gibbs, and I have the honor of being the current president of the Chamber of Commerce. I will also be one of the panelists asking the questions this evening, along with Mr. Shamari Scott, president-elect of the Chamber. I'd like to begin my opening comments by welcoming Richard Bernard, Emily Ducou, Frank McField, Roy McTaggart, and Christina hislop Rowlandson, and thanking them for accepting the Chamber's invitation to participate in this forum. Your willingness to appear on this platform demonstrates to voters that you take the democratic process seriously and are ready to respond to a series of questions on the top issues as identified by a recent online Chamber survey. More than 400 responses and more than 200 questions have been submitted via the survey, and these will help to frame the questions for this evening's forum. There is certainly not enough time to ask all the questions, but we will do our best to cover the topics that have been identified as the most important to the Cayman Islands and the Georgetown East constituency. When the Chamber was established in 1965, the goal was to create an organization that supports, promotes, and protects the interests on welfare, sorry, the interests and welfare of its members and the wider community. Being nonpartisan, we have hosted forums every election year since the 1988 election. So for nine elections, we have provided members of the community with an opportunity to hear from their candidates and educate themselves before election day. These forums have taken weeks of planning and preparation, with all the credit going to the hardworking chamber staff, but would not have been possible without the financial support of our sponsors, Foster's Affinity Recruitment, Bodden's Legal and Corporate, and DART, so a very big thank you to them. I would also like to extend a wholehearted thanks to our media partners, Cayman Mile Road, Cayman Life TV, Radio Cayman, Government Information Services, and ICCI FM for agreeing to broadcast tonight's forum. It is the first time that we have live streamed the forums on the internet, and we hope that this new format will enable even more people to watch them in the comfort of your home. If you have missed or would like to re-watch any of the earlier forums, you can visit the Chamber's YouTube channel to view them. It's now time to begin this evening's forum. I will therefore turn the proceedings over to Mr. Will Pinot, CEO of the Chamber, who will serve as this evening's moderator. He will explain the rules of the forum and introduce the Georgetown East candidates. Good evening, candidates. The rules for tonight's forum are as follows. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions, and you'll have two minutes to respond if you choose to do so. Each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption and is free to differ with the position or opinion of another candidate during your allotted response time. Candidates should deal solely with the issues, and at the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will be allowed two and a half minutes to deliver a closing statement. Now, I'd like to introduce this evening's candidates from Georgetown East. I begin with Emily Ducou. Born, raised, and educated in the Cayman Islands her entire life, Mrs. Ms. Ducou went to the Savannah Primary and Triple C schools before studying environmental science at the University College of the Cayman Islands and the early childhood education and paralegal studies through online tertiary programs. Professionally, Ms. Ducou has worked in the legal sector and financial services industry for over a decade across a wide range of fields within each sector. She currently serves as a global green team liaison for her firm's America's offices. Ms. Deku has contributed to the community in many ways over her life, partaking in beach and roadside cleanups, fostering and volunteering her with uh, local animal welfare organizations, teaching literacy and numeracy skills to local primary school students, and working for and volunteering with Jasmine, formerly known as Cayman Hospice Care, and partaking in shave for Pediatric Cancer Awareness Organization, St. Baldrick's. She enjoys conducting informative sessions as the founder of Grand Nature Cayman, a nonprofit organization she started in 2019 
that helps businesses, individuals, and students learn how they can take care of the planet. Welcome. Ms. Christina Hislop Rowlandson promotes trade with territories and internationally, and while a top level policy advisor, she represented our government in Barbados, Brussels, Greenland, Jamaica, Paris, Turks and Caicos Islands, and Trinidad. She firmly believes greater cooperation creates stronger communities. While in the cabinet office, Ms. Hislop Rowlandson championed strong government transparency, excellent risk governance training, safety of the environment, and poverty reduction. She provided research on best practice to chief officers and department head colleagues and led the nation's bid to build a Doppler radar to improve weather warning systems and to collect rehousing and to collect rehousing aid after Hurricane Ivan, which benefited people all over the island. She is interested in national security. Welcome. Mr. Richard Bernard is an accountant by profession. He also has an extensive hospitality experience working in various hotels in the Cayman Islands as night manager and audit. He's a father of four, all receiving higher education. Mr. Bernard believes education is one of the key components for the development of our people and the progression of our country. He's an avid sports person, having been <coughs> on the organizing committee in 1995 when the Carifta Games were held here in the Cayman Islands. In 2000, he was the team manager for the Olympic team in Sydney, Australia, into which one of the athletes, Sidoni Mothersill, won a bronze medal for the 200 meters. Presently, Mr. Bernard is still a FIFA certified referee for football in the Cayman Islands and is still active. Welcome. Mr. Roy McTaggart grew up on Crew Road. He was educated in the local public high school and obtained his certified public accounting qualification overseas. Mr. McTaggart had a successful career spanning almost 30 years with KPMG, the last nine as managing partner. He has been active in many roles in the community, including the Chamber of Commerce, Cayman Airways, Board, Treasurer of the Church of Christ, and mentoring young Caymanians. He retired from the firm in 2012 to pursue election to public office. Elected in 2013, Mr. McTaggart served as a counselor in three ministries, including health, finance, and financial services. Following his re-election in 2017, he served as the Minister for Finance and Economic Development. Mr. McTaggart is married and has three children. Welcome, Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. And Mr. Frank, Dr. Frank McField previously served as an MLA for Georgetown from 1996 to 2005, where he served as minister in the now defunct UDP government from 2001 to 2005. Dr. McField is a sociologist, playwright, and politician. He studied history and political science at City University of New York and continued his postgraduate studies at York University in England in South African politics. He gained his doctorate from the University of Bremen, West Germany, in 1979. His work has been performed in New York, London, Germany, and the Caribbean. Caribbean. And his second play, Downside Up, is one of his most widely produced plays. Welcome. Thank you. Take a deep breath now. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a short commercial break. And when we return, we'll begin the round of questions, the first round. So please stay tuned.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown East. Now I'm going to turn over the proceedings for the first round of questions to President Mike Gibbs. Thank you, Will. And once again, good evening, candidates. And we look forward to a great debate this evening, or a forum, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, this first question, um, which I will address to uh, Mr. Koo, uh, and then each of the candidates will respond in order down the table, um, is as regards to your, why are you the candidate of choice? What makes you the candidate of choice for the voters of Georgetown East? Thank you for that question, Mike. Um, I strongly believe that I am the candidate of choice for Georgetown East um, because of uh, the skills that I bring to the table, namely a passion for the environment that's unwavering, a desire to represent the community as they need to be represented, in providing the perspective that we need to ensure uh, long-term preservation of our islands, um, our environment, our culture, our traditions, our heritage, um, for future generations to inherit. Um, my integrity and my unwavering stance and uh, desire to ensure good governance uh, is is second nature to me. It's a no-brainer for me to champion and advocate in government for those who are um, perhaps not as fortunate um, and giving them a voice within government. And that's um, something I'm really excited to potentially be able to do. Um, you know, I also, I studied environmental science. I also studied uh, early childhood education and paralegal studies, which kind of round out my platform of environmental conservation, education reform, and equality for all. And these are all areas I'm very passionate about and which I see are national issues that have become national crises um, due to poor representation. And I want to be the change that my country deserves and, and needs. Um, I think my perspective on being um, one of the younger candidates running this year is that I offer a sort of different uh, vision for the future um, and seeing that this country reach, reaches its full potential to the best of its ability is something really important to me. Um, and ensuring that Georgetown East has uh, the best representation that it can have is, is also equally important. Thank you. Ms. hislop Rollinson. same question, please. Sure. Um, I think what's important to convey is that um, I'm an independent. Um, that means I'm nonpartisan. Um, I do feel that party politics has polarized the Cayman Islands, um, been very divisive, increasingly so. So I definitely think it's time for the Cayman Islands to embrace an independent-led government. Um, I certainly um, believe that real representation includes uh, knowing the profile of your constituents, I think we're very fortunate in Georgetown East to have a really good mix. Um, you sort of, you know, you have the sort of from the flood prone zones, which need extra attention to the, the wealthier South Sound. Um, there's a lot of uh, different people with different experiences and different resources. Um, and I'd really like to work together with the constituents to make a better Cayman. I think we can do so much better than we're doing. Um, We've seen the social and cultural loss. We've seen the environmental loss. And we just really need to turn that around and, um, and really give hope to the younger generations coming after us. Um, I'm a graduate of business school and law school and very familiar with government. I'm having worked in the cabinet <coughs> office, um, actually supporting premiers. So I'm very familiar with that role in international relations. But, but being able to represent uh, Georgetown East gives me an opportunity to get more involved with domestic policy. And I believe that we have the resources on island and that we can combine those with external expertise. Um, and I just really hope that um, we will all work together, whatever the outcome of the elections. Um, and I also say that my back, I have a very early background in health care. And with the COVID pandemic, I have a lot of um, unique um, experiences and, and knowledge that I can bring to the fore as we um, go to reopen our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bernard, same question, please. Thank you for the question. I think I would be the candidate of choice for a myriad of reasons. Number one, I live in the area. I know a lot of the people there. I'm a very sociable person. I'm the kind of person that gets things done. Um, I'm reliable dependable, and I'm one of those persons that can gather teams together. I work a lot with 
youth as being involved with sports. Uh, previously, <clears throat> I've also worked in the hospitality industry, so I'm a very sociable person. Um, in the community, we do have some of the real problems that have not been addressed. And I believe that being a candidate of choice, I, along with those people from the area, can address those. Also, I also believe it is very important that we have a district advisory council, and they will act as a liaison between myself and the people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McTaggart, same question. Thank you, Mike. Everything I have done in my life thus far has prepared me for this role and for this moment. I grew up in Georgetown East. I know the community and I know the people. I have proven leadership abilities and skills and I have a wealth of experience that I bring to the table in government, both locally, nationally, regionally and internationally. And I'm comfortable operating in any of those environments, both in the private sector and the public sector. I've had this experience and I truly deep, deep, deeply care about our, the country and our people. My knowledge and experience in finance and financial services stems over 30 years in, uh, as a managing partner and partner and managing partner in one of the world's largest, the world's largest accounting firms. I grew the business locally when I first started from 25 staff to 250 staff. And I've also had eight years in government, four years as a councillor, four years as minister. I have successfully managed public and private sector entities in both the good times and the bad. From Hurricane Ivan in 2004 and moving an entire office to a third country. I successfully managed my, our business through the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, and more recently in dealing with the pandemic as a Minister of Government. I have gained great experience, and I think we have delivered well for, uh, for the country in what we have accomplished. Great number of years in community service, many of them <coughs> as chairman of entities I wasn't just asked to be, not be on boards, I was asked to lead. And it is those skills that I bring to the table tonight and make me the, the ideal choice. Thank you. Mr. McPhail. Thank you, sir. And um, I think that it is very important from the very beginning that when we come to interview for this very, very special and prestigious position, that we understand that, the, that we need to be able to emotionally relate to people to empathize with them, to socialize with them, not just stand away from them and make solutions as if people have nothing to do with the solutions that you are creating or implementing for them. My whole life I have spent in types of environments that are very important to be considered at this particular time in very large sec sections of Georgetown East and also in many other parts of the Cayman Islands. We have a society like a ship that has been going forward at a speed that just suits a special interest group in this country and the rest of the people have been left behind. Now to be able to bridge those gaps so that there's not upheavals and more disharmony we have to be able to have a doctor in the house that can actually deal with these issues, that have been talking about these issues and writing about these issues for the last 40 years. I'm appropriately trained in my area. Finance is important, but people are more important. We do not put profit about people, and I think that's what we've done in this country as it is at the moment. And so we need to get back to reality. There needs to be harmony. There needs to be balances, balancing between our pursuit of money and our pursuit of humanity and healing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shamari Scott will now ask the next question. <coughs> Good night, candidates. Good to see you all here. 
The second question, I'll start with Ms. Hislop Rowlandson, mm -hmm. and it has to do with national issues. Mm -hmm. What main national issues do you intend to champion if elected? Uh, just one or, or several? What main national issues? Sure. So you can choose one or as many as you can okay, get. Okay, good. Okay. Well, I'll start with the development conflict. Um, I think Cayman has developed at such a fast rate that we, we always seem to be trying to catch up. Um, so I'm, my manifesto, I suppose, would be the Vision 2008, which is our national strategic plan. I feel that we need to reassert that and reissue that. Um, it was a very good product uh, developed over many, many months with a lot of roundtables, with a lot of business leaders, community leaders. Um, so we do need to focus on slowing down slightly because we do need to prepare our country to take more advantage of, of the opportunities that are coming our way. Um, certainly we're a small island. Uh, I think we need to plan in terms of our land use, you know, what we want to keep as um, natural habitat, what we want to keep for farming, and what we want to um, keep for housing. And obviously not all the land is suitable for housing. I mean, we have been depleting our mangroves at a, at a very um, fast rate. And we do need to decide areas that we do need those mangroves because they provide lots of drainage. Um, so I really feel that's a really important area, um, the environment. Um, but also the social issues. I really feel that we need to uh, reform education and uh, create a lot more opportunities for young people um, in the employment sector. Um, I know in Cayman Brac, they're very good at, um, you know, facilitating their high school students to go to work um, during the summer holidays and also during um, school terms. And I feel that that is something that would be beneficial for Cayman Islands students as well, Grand Cayman students. Um, yeah, I think that's time up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bernard? Thank you for the question. There are three main national issues that I would champion. Number one would be the cost of living. Cayman has become the most expensive destination on this planet, and that is ridiculous. We definitely have to get a grip on the cost of living. Things are just too expensive. Yes, I agree. We import 95% of the things that we use in this country, but we could also do some other things. We can produce some of those things here locally. We can also grow some crops here locally. We don't have to be importing a lot of the food stuff that we are now importing. Um, back in the 60s, my granduncle had the first bakery in the Caymans, and we didn't import it bread. All the breads were made locally here in the Caymans, but now all the breads are imported. There's no more local breads being made in, in this country. I also believe that affordable housing is another major, major issue in this country. And the cost of material, all those imported mainly from Florida, it is just very, very expensive. We could bring those costs down simply by just doing some things very simple. Going to the Flowers Group, going to uh, Scott's Group, and a lot of the stuff that they're importing, we give them the concessions and then use some of the government land to build some affordable housing to first time home buyers. So there will be some of my issues there. Thank you, sir. Mr. McTaggart. Well, I think the most pressing prop issue that we face right now is a safe handling of the reopening of our economy and dealing with the vaccination program to get our people treat, um, vaccinated against the virus that will allow us to uh, safely reopen. That is the single biggest issue that we face, are facing right now, and it is immediate and at hand. But I think we have to take the, the same sort of careful approach we have taken thus far that has stood us so well in, um, in dealing with uh, COVID-19. One, we take a very measured approach one that follows the science and the recommendations and what the medicine is telling us in terms of, uh, of its vaccination for people and when it would be safe to, to reopen. Um, apart from the, the measure, managing that process, then we, 
I think other two issues that I would champion is one, the um, traffic situation that exists. No secret, the big choke point um, of the Hurley's roundabout rests in the Georgetown East constituency. And I get complaints daily from people, not just within the constituency, but from, from without, but, um, especially if you're living to the east of, uh, of the roundabout. So that is a, a huge issue, a number of things being done to, to deal with that and to alleviate, but just building more roads is not the answer. We desperately need to have a, a public transportation system that's reliable and one that is suitable and fit for purpose to help us achieve it and to reduce the, the strain on the traffic on the roads at this time. A third issue that I will, would like to follow is that of health care. Um, I think the current system of health care and health insurance is, is broken. It doesn't, uh, it's not fit for purpose. Our current scheme really ensures that everyone at some point will end up being taken care of by the government. That's not sustainable. Thank you, sir. Dr. McField? I, I guess the most um, unfortunate thing about politics is hindsight. And um, it, it would be good if people would become more proactive and really think long term. We used to have vision 2005. You remember, we had a vision. We threw it out of the door. We had this. We threw it out of the door. We seem to be a society that really hate planning. We hate to uh, forecast our challenges. We destroy people who say we should think future came out. Now, we're in the pandemic situation, and we were blessed by God to have prospered in this particular way. And we should take a warning from that. Now, what? how are we going to get out of this? We're in an election, and people are saying we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other thing. We don't even know if we're going to go too far. Because those people who say they are familiar with international affairs, they're not. They haven't studied history. They haven't studied people's culture. They don't know their languages. They don't know very much. We're like, a lot of people are like in caves. And they look out like with binoculars and they see in a straight direction, but they do not get the whole picture. And I think it's time that we understand that there is situations in the world that could change everything for us. We have to put our people back to work. We've got a, pe a lot of people that worked in the tourism industry that have nothing. We have a crisis on our hands. And we need to be talking to people about how we're going to come out of this. And we need to come out of it this by looking at the finances that we have and see how we can distribute the wealth that is there in a way that will cause our society to be able to protect Reduce the types of activities and rewards which are necessary to sustain us if people can't come back in. We're just talking about opening up, but what about opening up the reservoir of people power that we have in this country and going on from there? Thank you, sir. <coughs> Ms. Deku. Thank you, Shamari. I think the main national issues that need to be um, address as a matter of, of urgency for the next administration really come down to the effects of unsustainable development that a lot of people are feeling and that are quite negatively felt by a lot of people, um, such as the high and rising cost of living, um, flooding and stormwater drainage issues, which are big for people living in the Georgetown East constituency, um, traffic congestion and unsafe road infrastructure, um, you know, unemployment is is pretty high as well. Um, we've got issues with um, just thinking long term, I think, and having the proactivity uh, to plan really long term for our long term sustainability. Um, so coming in, I would be really heavily um, championing for some sort of a holistic sustainable development plan to be put in place that looks at the future of Cayman long term, 20 to 30 years ahead of us, and factors in what we want our country to look like in the coming decades and prepares our people to fill those roles and those careers that you know, those industries that should be looked at, such as the STEM fields, agriculture, permaculture, uh, renewable energy, and other environmental conservation and uh, anti-pollution industries. Um, 
in order to get there, we need to ensure that our education system is uh, adequate for our people to be employable, to gain the skills to fill those roles. So education reform is another mass massive national issue that I would intend to address when elected. Um, and to, I guess, round off my platform a bit there, uh, equality is... Uh, very close to my heart, and I, I observe that inequality is at the root of many social ills that uh, we face in our country, and the more we can do to lessen divisiveness in Cayman, economically, socially, um, the better. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Bernard, this next question will be uh, addressed to you first, uh, and switches from national issues to constituency issues. And the question is, what do you consider to be the most pressing social and economic issues facing the people of Georgetown East? Thank you for the question, Mike. The most pressing issue for Georgetown East is flooding. And one of the main areas for flooding is the Randyke Gardens area. That is, can be called a sinkhole. Also, houses that were built there uh, some decades ago, they were built, the foundations were built too low. Already there was a problem with flooding because of the low lying areas. And then planning approved a lot of the buildings there um, without the land being filled. And then also for the foundations to be very low. Adding to the problem presently, there was a development which is to the back of Randwick Gardens that has been approved and building has gone on there. And that land has been built up and elevated. So this <coughs> adds to the problem of Randite when it rains. And as a matter of fact, if, if you know the area, when it rains from the Linford Pearson Highway, you can see the water gushing down from the Linford Pearson Highway down into Randite Gardens. Because when that highway was built, the road was elevated, making it higher than the land. And that is just preposterous. Thank you. Mr. McTaggart, same question, please. Yeah. Um, within Georgetown East, there are, one of the major air things are, is the flooding that exists in the area. And that is, have, has a significant uh, effect on residents who are living in these low-lying areas. But this is not a new problem. It has existed now for 30, probably 35 years, and no one's really been able to find a solution up to, to the issue at this point. Um, I'm committed to seeing that, that these, we, we do what we can to alleviate and try to, to mitigate some of these things. And one of the big issues that we'll have to deal with and is the whole issue of storm water management and uh, allowing, uh, you know, how that gets treated and how it gets dealt with as development continues. Let's face it, the, 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 um, the community continues to grow and to expand, and in particular along the Linford Pearson Highway, that area will continue to, to develop. So it's a matter of addressing the, the issues that, uh, that affect them in that area. Thank you. Dr. Midfield. Thank you, sir. I, I think that um, we, we have to look at the fact that many of these problems, many of these issues have just be just piled up over, over a very long period of time because they have not been addressed properly. Uh, the Randyke area, uh, I, I would think that what we would want to do is to give some, um, some, some revitalization loans or grants to the people in that area because they're suffering from the fact that the planning department was not visual enough with the plans that are developed per broad. It's not their problem that they invested uh, in confidence and that they have been more or less cheated. And it's the government responsibility a long time to look into these things. Uh, we might be developing more affordable housing in that area as well because it's along the main artery there going into Georgetown. And if we're not going to spread our towns out, then they're going to be in there. And we got to look at a more viable uh, means of transportation to get people in there. We don't want to continue to, to make more roads and just make more flooding because we're creating more water 
And 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 the stormwater management is something that should have been taken care of a long time ago. We shouldn't be talking about it here now. And what are the priorities of governments? The priorities of governments to make more money, sell more rights, whether or not it's work rights or land rights. We are just selling our rights. So we have to see that we have to replenish the society that we kind of drain and ignored. Randyck and what goes on in that area is a real shame. And of course, we have problems with the with the with the development in in South um, South Sound, the East part there, and and we need to be able to take those things into account. There are a lot of things that we need to manage at one time, but it, it's very important that what we get is a holistic approach to what has to be done and what the priorities should be. Thank you. Mr. Ku, same question, please. Thank you. What do I consider to be the most pressing social and economic issues facing Georgetown East? Um, I think tying back to unsustainable development, the issues that I touched on earlier, they have ripple effects on people's quality of life, which affects how they can um, contribute best socially, I think, uh, and economically. Um, you know, when people, the cost of living is high, people live paycheck to paycheck, you're finding that more often. People aren't able to kind of play hard as much as they are working hard um, and being able to maintain their quality of life that way. Um, when they're is a flooding issue. People's um, house values are going down. People's home insurance is going up. That's another expense that was un, you know, not anticipated um, due to just factors out of their control. Um, traffic congestion, it just steals hours of people's days, um, just sitting in traffic from the eastern districts um, coming through Georgetown East. But people sitting in traffic in Georgetown East can sometimes take an hour just to get from... Um, you know, just before the boardwalk to the Hurley's roundabout some days if, you know, they catch it at a bad time. So when you add that on to both ends, morning and evening, you're, you're, you could be facing losing an hour to two hours a day that you could be spending at home with your kids with homework and making a meal and, um, you know, perhaps working and, and earning money. Um, you know, affordable housing is another issue that's a, a really big issue that the next government will need to address. Um, it, something that affects people's um, sort of morale is the consideration of will I be able to afford property in my own home? And the gentrification going on through South Sound as well as Cayman as a whole is, is making that dream more and more far out of reach for a lot of Caymanians and a lot of young Caymanians. Um, and I think these are some of the major um, national, or sorry, constituency issues um, that are facing the people of Georgetown East. Thank you. Mrs. Lop Rollinson. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, the, probably the, the biggest um, issue in Georgetown East is the congestion. Um, it's a very frustrating um, state of affairs, and I think it could have been solved a long time ago. We do desperately need to establish a bus route. Um, various candidates um, over the various forums have suggested various means of transportation, um, <coughs> like the monorail. Um, I would sort of I can see something like the trolley that you see in Boston, you know, something that's um, appealing to the eye and that's um, obviously comfortable, air conditioned. Um, I believe that a lot of families and children would use that um, to get to school because a lot of the congestion is related to triple C um, and other school routes. Um, so that will be really key in terms of establishing that as a priority. Um, the other issues, there's a lot of um, social uh, networking and connectivity in South Sound uh, among the residents and they're very passionate about environment so I think they have a lot of lively debates about um, how Cayman needs to be doing a lot more um, so I think we would give them a lot of relief if we could take that as a priority as well going forward. Um, in terms of um, the uh, sorry <laughs> in terms of the um, social issues of flooding, I also feel there are solutions for that as well in terms of relocating some of the owners that are still there. Um, a lot of those houses are rented. Um, and I think it's just a pity that that planning permission was given by government. Um, but of course, that was a long time ago. But both uh, land, lands adjacent to it um, are going to be built up, which is going to make exasperate, exasperate their, their issues. So 
we really need to urgently look at relocation for all those residents. Um, a lot of them do rent the property, so hopefully Cayman has other rental stock available throughout the island that will be options for them. Um, but we do need to make sure that they are settled and secure. Thank you. And this is round four, question four, and it will start with you, Mr. McTaggart. And this question has to do with education, which seems to be an issue for many election cycles. Yeah. Do you believe there is enough accountability and transparency in the Cayman Islands education system for both public and private schools? If not, what are the problem areas and how would you address them? Certainly, I think within the, uh, within the public, public education system, um, I don't believe that there is sufficient accountability. Um, I think there, what we need right now is a, a new governance model within, the, uh, within this public school system that would transfer a lot of the decision-making and accountability back to the schools themselves and the leadership of the schools. A new government governance model that is needed must include the parents of the students and allowing them, again, to have a say in the running of their schools and the policies that are adopted. I think if we can get that right, then certainly it will place the accountability right where it needs to. Within the private sector schools, I do believe that they, they, um, that they, they do have proper um, governance models that allow for, uh, for uh, the parents to participate in and having a say in their children's education. And I think if we can get, get our parents back involved in our, our public schools in particular, that it will have a very significant effect on the, the students themselves, because I think the parents getting involved in their education and being a part of the process is something that is lacking right now in, in our pro public schools. So I do believe uh, there's great opportunity there. Thank you, sir. Dr. McField? <clears throat> Well, I mean, this is a big question on education, and I don't really want to sort of be pretentious and offer solutions just like that. But I think that we need to have a whole overhaul of the educational system. It's not a question of accountability. It's a question of lack of ability to have the foresight to plan properly for our people. Identity and education goes together. If people don't know their identity, if people are rejecting their, their identity, it's very hard to educate them. I can tell you that. There have there's been uh, studies that have been done. We have the wrong approach. We, we bring people in and we will not train our own teachers. We build buildings to say we built the best buildings in the world. And we have not built teachers. We have not given them the kind of pay, the kind of motivation, and the kind of authority within the school system that would make them leaders that would be leading our children. The children are left at home. I was fired, first of all, from government in 1979. My PhD was in 77, by the way. And 79, I was fired for advocating for early childhood education. 79 already. We knew the problem. In London, we knew those problems. <clears throat> I brought that knowledge back here and they rejected it. So part of the problem we have is that we don't, re we don't accept sensible knowledge. Having sense and no reference is the worst thing in the world. It's one thing to have sense, but you need reference too. That's what we need to do. We need to have people who know where to refer to to get the types of solutions that we need to improve our educational system. Thank you, sir. Mr. Koo? Thank you. Um, based on the outcomes of what, you know, how our students are graduating rather than being um, graduates based on atten uh, attainment, rather, they're graduating based on attendance. And I, in our public school system, a lot is what we find. And I think that shows that there's a clear lack of accountability and transparency. Um, the solution to that, to me, is good governance and better governance of the schools. Um, that being said, I am a supporter of depoliticizing education um, to give more of a say in the hands of the parents, the teachers, and the principals and the school faculty um, so that they can tell the Department of Education Services what their needs are for their students um, rather than sort of the other way around as the model currently works. 
I think that would provide <coughs> the schools with a level of, you know, parents wanting to ensure that they're, you know, when you send your kid to school, you want to ensure they're actually learning what you're, if you're a private school teacher, what you're paying for them to, uh, a private school parent rather, what you're paying for is actually being absorbed by your child. Um, public school system uh, parents have equal expectations that their child is going to learn what they're sending them to school for eight hours a day. Um, so we need to, we, at the end of the day, we have to remember the big picture, which is that it's an investment to ensure our children are learning and are gaining an education so that they can contribute to society. Um, so whatever we can do to ensure better accountability and transparency for our schools, I would 100% support. Um, private schools and the public schools are, they get annual um, inspections. And so we can use that as a, you can use a baseline to see where we can improve uh, across the board and uh, take some of the recommendations from some of the uh, shelved commissioned reports that have been done by uh, the Ministry of Education over the years. Um, see what they have to say and uh, see what accountability and transparency solutions they propose and, and explore those and see if they could work to our schools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hislop Rollinson. Sure. I'm picking up on actually what um, Mr. Koo was uh, mentioning about government reports. I was involved with um, the review of the education department very early in my career. And a lot of those recommendations were not implemented. Um, and this is a common theme I find in government. There's lots of reports done, but they just don't seem to see the light of day and to help with the change. Um, so I think we need a better a change of um, attitude towards advice. I think we need to um, pivot more readily um, and embrace the changes that are recommended. Sometimes, you know, it just takes a bit more bravery and courage, but I think, you know, when we hired the experts and they've um, done in-depth studies, I think we do need to um, follow what they're suggesting. Um, in terms of transparency and accountability, of course, um, the parents and the the parents are the main people that the school should be accountable to. Um, it, the school should be a very safe place for children. I think that is being jeopardized and compromised at the moment in terms of um, the drugs in schools and even um, harassment <coughs> of some of the girls. Um, so I think we need to take um, a reality check and make sure that those schools are safe. Um, in the UK, of course, they've got this... Uh, they're having a bit of a crisis at the moment um, because they've, they've identified a sort of a rape culture. And um, so we don't want to go down that route. And so I think we, we really need to look, have a look at what safeguarding issues we have in place. Uh, we need more safeguarding support. And if necessary, we also need to twin with some other schools that have more resources in this area. Um, it's a model that the UK uses very effectively in terms of a state school um, teeing up with a um, independent school. And they're able to share resources and um, for everybody's um, improvement and enhancement. So I think that that would be an area to explore going forward as well. Thank you. Mr. Bernard. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> there is definitely not enough accountability or transparency in the educational system in the Cayman Islands. And it definitely needs overhauling. We seem to have a two-tier system in this country where... We have the private schools and we have the government run schools. Now, the government is also funding private schools. Private school teachers are paid handsomely because they receive tuitions from those private schools. However, the government school children are seen to be left behind. The teaching that the students get in the public schools or the private schools, rather, they're not getting that level in the government schools. They are failing miserably. This definitely needs to be overhauled. Also, when our children graduate from the public schools, a lot of them do not get the opportunity to go on to tertiary education. And another problem that we find, a lot of this, this policy that the government has, expat people that come to the islands, their children cannot go to government schools. They have to go to private schools. And this creates a problem. So let's say for seven to 10 years, you, you've gone to a private school 
as a as an expat child. And after you graduate, then all of a sudden you get into the public arena where you're going to get a job, and then you're going to be introduced to a child from the public school. There has never been any cohesion there. So you have this separation from when children are in the private and the public schools. That needs to stop. Thank you, sir. Dr. McField, this, uh, this will be the last question in the first round of questions, and I will be addressing it to you first. And we've already been touched on is the uh, traffic issue. The lack of adequate and efficient road and development planning has made the Hurley's Roundabout the island's most critical and urgent infrastructure issue. The situation will only get worse <clears throat> as hundreds of additional vehicles are expected to add to the traffic once developments near the roundabout are completed over the next year. What proposal will you be submitting to the new government to address this situation? Well, I'd like to say first, I think that many of these questions are so are very broad questions, and for the time that we have to answer it, 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 it is unfair, I think, to the listeners, because we don't want to give people false impressions. We want to have worked out solutions, and even if we have worked out solutions, we can't give it in this amount of time. So I just want to say that what we do always is that we give people the impression that these pe questions are all solvable, and if we bring our ideology here or a point of view here, we'll solve the problem. I don't like that kind or particular way of addressing these issues. They are complicated issues, and the amount of time allocated for these issues only gives people a false impression, and I like, I'm a truthful man. I like to be truthful. We have to do something about our egos in this country. We have to address the whole idea of materialism, the fact we got to have our own cars and that we don't care. It, these are people's responsibility. We have to lead. We talk about accountability, but we have to teach people values. We have to lead by values. We can't just say we're going to make problems and we're going to solve them and we're not going to deal with the, pro the, the question of moral and value breakdown in our society. We have to seek it. Everybody is, is, is agreeing with independent candidates and independent this and we got 600 different ideas and when we get together, how are we going to come together and have a cohesiveness to be able to form a government or to solve problems if people do not spend time debating these issues and only during election time take these issues up. And I must caution the nation about continuing to pretend that it's all about what comes out of the mouth and not comes out of the heart in the actions of people. We need to restrain ourselves and restrain our egos and come back to reality and start it. There's nothing wrong with bicycles and walking. I've done it all the time, and I'll do it again. We need to become realistic. Thank you. Mr. Koo, same question. Thank you, Mike. It's a great question because it's an issue that affects literally everybody in GTE at some point, probably once during the day, and for people coming from the eastern districts, at least probably twice a day on average. And it's a source of frustration for a lot of people. Um, it's unsafe. Um, you know, we've got people living in the South Sound Road area who, at the top of, um, like, by the by-the-sea condos, they are a five minute walk, but they cannot even walk across Hurley's sa to, to Hurley safely uh, because the road infrastructure is not safe for them. Um, I know that th the situation absolutely will only compound as these new developments go up over time. So my proposal, um, you know, especially given the number of developments going up, is to perhaps say radically put a pause on them for the moment, figure out the road infrastructure situation. Perhaps it means quickly implementing a robust um, plan to address the public transport system to make sure that perhaps these people moving into these developments may not need to import a car if they're not going to be from here. Um, they can have an alternative mode of transportation. If they choose to cycle, they have safe roads within which to do so. They're living in uh, central Georgetown, uh, not the constituency of Georgetown Central, but chances are they're probably working in the district as well. So. Alternative modes of transportation should be looked at, uh, especially given that that's such a bottleneck for the district and the constituency. Um, it's, it's, you know, it is absolutely urgent to address, and it's something the next administration needs to prioritize, not only for the safety aspect, um, the, the quality of life aspect that 
you know, people are impacted by sitting in traffic and getting to this dangerous part of the roundabout and having to navigate it and, you know, just hope they get around three lane roundabout <laughs> safely. Um, you know, cyclists, same concern. Absolutely. That's a dangerous point for cyclists. Uh, so that those would be my proposals to address that um, sort of point. Thank you. Mrs. Lop Rowlandson, same question. Please. Sure. Uh, I've already mentioned public transportation as a solution, um, but there are other solutions. I think we need to take a multi-pronged approach. Uh, we can have staggered openings of schools. We can have more hybrid working, just as we did um, during the lockdown. Uh, and we need to focus more on planning. That is really the major issue here. Um, why have we approved so many developments at one time <laughs> in a very high-risk um, area? Um, of course, we know from Hurricane Ivan that that area was um, sort of underwater for, for quite an extended period of time. So I think we need to look at reform of planning. Um, we seem to, the planning department, although while they have a section for strategy and planning, they're very much operational in terms of making sure that approvals are made in time for the CPA. Um, so I think we need to rebalance the planning department and have maybe two clear divisions where you have one division focusing on the strategy and the holistic planning, and one dealing with approvals. Um, there's also the initiative um, in the community to create district councils. In the UK, district councils are planning authorities. And I have no doubt in my mind that if there was a district council in Georgetown East, we would not have seen so many developments be put up at the same time that are so, so that are high density. I mean, it really is going to be an absolute nightmare. I have talked to some of the developers, and they are hoping to apportion some of those developments to Airbnb so that we're not looking at full-time residents who are going to be on the road commuting, on the road to go to schools. So that should help somewhat. But um, it really is a very challenging situation. So we need to, to put the public transportation in immediately. And we need to hear from the National Roads Authority, who will have suggestions on what can be done. I mean, one suggestion that I have made is actually making that roundabout a traffic light system. Because um, it is, I mean, people do feel like they're putting their life in their hands when they're on that roundabout. Um, so I think something else um, would help that area. Um, and obviously there is talk about an extra road um, so that people can get to the Grand Harbour Shopping Centre from the local communities um, rather than them having to get into all of that traffic with everybody from the east who's coming into town. So thank you. Out of time. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Bernard, same question, please. <clears throat> yes. Quite frankly, traffic is not just a problem. It is a nightmare in this country. There are just too many motor vehicles. Some of my solutions would be, number one, we start to put quotas on the importation of vehicles. And that is in proportionate to sizes and the types of vehicles that we import. Because for the size of our roads, it is preposterous for us to be importing Hummers. These are very large and wide vehicles, and they take up a lot of road space. And a lot of the roads that were built previously were not built with side lanes, bicycle lanes, and so on. So we just don't have the road space. In addition, what we need to do, we need to have staggered time for some businesses. All of the businesses don't need to be opening at the same time. We don't need to have the banks opening at the same time, the schools are opening, the same time businesses are opening, because you're putting everybody on the road at the same time. And this is one of the major problems. In addition, what we need to do, we also need to put a halt on persons importing vehicles into this country that don't have anywhere to park them. This is also becoming a major, major problem because we're getting double parking in, in lots of the areas, especially in Georgetown East, in some of those small roads. We're getting double parking. You're getting people parking on sidewalks. You're getting people parking right next to a fire hydrant. And people are parking there from in the afternoons. Their car is there all night. As a matter of fact, if you drive around right now to some of the areas, you will see this major problem. So we need to limit the amount of vehicles that is imported into this country. 
Thank you. Mr McTaggart, same question. Thank you. Well, at that roundabout, a number of things and, and uh, adjustments have been made to the roundabout to improve the, the flow of traffic, and they seem to be working, except that there is, it, it, it still is not able to deal adequately with the flow through of traffic, which I'm told now exceeds 40,000 cars a day. There's also the widening of uh, the, <clears throat> the, the east-west arterial road from the King's Roundabout right up to the, um, the Prospect Roundabout, extending that to three lanes. Those things do contribute in terms of the amount of traffic that is able to flow through. And you have the new roads that are going to be constructed off the King's Roundabout that are going to feed traffic, pull traffic off the, um, off the, 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 the east-west arterial and crew road into the Grand Harbour area, traffic going in there, pulling them off earlier, which will, as all, traffic studies say, it will work and it will, it will help to alleviate the situation. So all these things are being done that will contribute, but it's not a total solution. Longer term, we have to look at limiting. I think it's time to, to look at limiting the number of cars that actually people are allowed to own. Uh, these are probably quite radical, but I think we do have to look at it at some way, some way of, uh, of reducing the number of cars that exist on the road. But we cannot, we absolutely cannot take that, those kinds of steps until we have an alternative in place for the population to embrace and to take full use of. And of course, I'm talking about a, a public transportation system that is so desperately needed. What works, what we have right now does not function, is not really fit for purpose. So we absolutely must get this first. And that would be the uh, one thing I would be saying to my colleagues in government that we must deal with immediately. Thank you. Thank the candidates. First round of questions is behind us now. So we're going to take a short commercial break. And when we return, the second round of questions. Please stay with us.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forums for Georgetown East. Now in the second round of questions. And to start us off, Shamari Scott. We'll start with you, Mr. Ku. And everybody's touched on cost of living already. So guess what? We have a specific question yes. on cost of living. So the cost of living ranked as a top issue for respondents in the most recent Chamber Public Survey. What strategies would you propose to address this issue? The cost of living is absolutely probably the biggest issue that faces people in Cayman as a whole. Um, you know, I'm, I've put together what I'm pretty proud to call a National Holistic Sustainable Development Plan, which really seeks to address the things that are the most expensive for people to, over the long term, create an environment where we're more self-sufficient. So people's expenses can go down, uh, our environment improves, um, and people just have a better quality of life. Um, mm -hmm. So to tackle the cost of living, the Holistic Sustainable Development Plan uh, would provide affordable housing. It would seek to uh, create less red tape from planning when it comes to building, say, a tiny home or a container home. Uh, it would seek to promote community gardens so uh, people can have both food security and uh, very close access to really nutrient-rich, wonderful, uh, locally grown foods. Um, and that could also create jobs. Um, keep going, cost of living. Um, with the Holistic Sustainable Development Plan, we would also be looking to promote and support students studying courses that lead to um, careers in upcoming industries that will ensure that Cayman uh, thrives more sustainably in the future. Um, so that diversifies the economy, that ensures that our people are educated and qualified and experienced to fill the roles that will be coming up. Um, it's a, it's something I'm really excited to bring to Cayman, uh, the idea of this uh, plan. Um, and it, it seeks to holistically just look at Cayman long term in terms of, um, you know, it, it wants, it seeks to make people happier, healthier and stronger so that you perhaps we can see health insurance premiums decrease over time as well. Um, so those are just some of the ways that I'm hoping the plan helps with the cost of living. Thank you. Ms. Hislop Rollinson. Mm, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Scott. Um, before I go into housing, which I'll probably speak about in some more detail, um, you have bills and insurance. Um, Fuel prices are very expensive at the moment, um, as they always have been. Um, perhaps we need to bring in some cost consultants to sort of see how we can make that more efficient to reduce the prices at the pump. Um, in terms of insurance, um, we have a system here where um, there are properties that are built on the coast, which are obviously higher risk. And actually, South Sound is actually one of the areas where there are probably the most, um, you know, the most houses with with a big square footage um, along the coast. So what they're actually doing is driving up the insurance prices for everybody. So I feel that we need to have a two-tier system for insurance in Cayman Islands. So we should have one for the coast and then one for properties that are further back, um, which are lower risk and should be more affordable. Um, so also health insurance is very high in the Cayman Islands. Um, the insurance industry makes a lot of profit from health insurance. So I feel that we need to claw back some of those premiums um, to lower those premiums um, for everybody. Um, uh, there's already an exodus of some health insurers. Um, <coughs> apparently this is due to um, their model not having being, being able to survive um, the COVID um, pandemic and the lockdown. So we are going to see a contraction in the number of health insurers. So I hope that we can continue that trend and be more efficient with our health insurance. Um, in terms of housing, um, one of the issues is that the, there's a lot of people in Cayman that earn a lot of very high income, and so they're driving the real estate prices up. The realtors assist that process as well because um, there are more profits to be made as house prices go up. So, but of course, this is excluding a lot of young professionals who find it very hard to get the foot in the door because the financing isn't available. I think we need more community banks and um, more lending and to to really look at a plan to control the pricing of housing. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Bernard? Cost of living, major, major problem in Cayman. There are a number of things we can do to bring the cost of living down. We can start with the input duties. 
because we do have some import duties, commodities that are imported, where the import duty on those items, especially like uh, food items, the duty is high. Some dry goods, some that are really not deemed very important. I'll give you a typical example. For example, imp the importation of wine glasses and briefcases, vinyl briefcases. They are duty free, but pampers and baby food is 22%. Now we seem to have our priorities turned backwards. You would think baby food and things like pampers for young children, they would be duty free, but they are not. We could also do other different things, such as we have been the fifth largest financial center on this planet, but we are no longer the fifth largest financial center. So people can get rid of that saying, that is no more. We have a lot of experience in banking, but every one of the banks in this country are foreign banks. Why haven't we, Caymanian people, started our own bank with our own people, with our own money, so that we could borrow money at a cheaper rate and that would bring also the cost of living down. Thank you, sir. Mr. McTaggart. Thank you, Shamari. I, I really have to be honest with, with the viewing public and to everyone tonight. When it comes to the cost of living, in terms of the everyday things that we consume, there is very little that we can do about it. The simple reason is, it's been alluded to earlier, 80 to 90% of all that we consume in this country is imported and it comes at a cost. So when there is inflation in the country of the source of our imports, we import that inflation into the country as well. And we saw that effect over this past year and throughout the pandemic, where prices <coughs> spiked in the US, and so prices here in terms of consumption goods um, spiked as well. But we've also seen you know, a real return and, and reduction in the, the level of inflation and the cost of living as well, because prices have settled down, returned to a more normal level. Now, in terms of uh, cost of living, there are a few options that we have available to us, and these are things that we can control ourselves or influence ourselves. I look at the cost of health care and health insurance. Um, a lot of the cost there is being driven by people going overseas for medical care. To where? Florida, the most expensive health care system in the world. If we were to make more use and full use of medical facilities at Health City and this new Asta Health Med City that is coming on board, we would see a very significant reduction in the cost of health care in this country. Closer to home as well, in terms of our utilities, there is a need and one we can, way we can influence things in reduced costs is by having you know, maybe solar programs for people's homes. Don't necessarily have to have 100% but certainly have something that they, they, you know, some power being provided by solar, which uh, I think would reduce the overall cost of things. But what's even more important is that we need to upskill and improve the earning potential of our citizens. And if we can do that, then I think we can do more to help our people in terms of coping with the, with the cost of living. Thank you, sir. Dr. McPhee. I think everything has to do with the lopsided way in which our society is organized. And that's why you need system analysts to be able to help the people to be work out some of the solutions. Now, you have cost of living and then you have income. And the income is low and the cost of living is high. You know why? Because the government is always feeding off the people. The government gets its revenue, the accounting geniuses say, from taxing food from taxing consumption, from taxing everything that people need. So you're going to have that. People need to tell the people that the system is set up to create great wealth and great poverty. It's, it's, it's an old colonial system that needs to be overhauled. And I've been saying this for 40 years. You can't solve the problem by patching here and patching there. 
It's, it's, it's a systematic problem. It's a systemic problem. It's in the system. It's inbred. You are relying upon taxing the majority to enrich the minority. That's the economy. That's the accounting system that Mr. T McTaggart is involved with. At the end of the day, you have to have a surplus. The government has to have a surplus so the people have a deficit. That's normal. That, that's a straight off accounting. Somebody has to have the deficit for somebody to have the surplus. It's not going to be all equal. So we have to look at these things again. And this is why I'm saying it's very important not to fool the people again by giving these, them, them these ideas that you could quickly fix their system. Their boat needs to go on dry dock and you need to do something about it. Thank you, sir. For the next question, uh, Ms. Hislop Rollinson will be addressing this to you. Focuses on the environment. Mm -hmm. and what do you regard as the highest risk to the Cayman Islands' natural environment, and what measures would you recommend to address this risk? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, we do have a very good marine park system. The problem is that it hasn't covered an extensive area. Um, there is a proposal that's gone through Cabinet, and I I believe it's maybe even been approved um, to expand that marine park. But the experts are saying that we need to do even more than that to save our reef species. Um, so in a sense, I would almost promote that the whole of our shoreline should be marine park. Um, and that will also create jobs because obviously if there's regulation and enforcement, that creates jobs. Um, but we do need to save a lot of these species, which apparently are almost becoming extinct. Um, so we have the, the grouper and the cubera snapper that both need to be um, banned from fishing. Um, the marine park that's been extended recently by, this, uh, by the last administration actually does not include the spawning areas um, for these species. So obviously we do need to expand that marine park system even more. Um, and then, of course, the parrotfish produce, uh, I think it's 80% of the sand. So... Certainly, there needs to be a ban on fishing for that for them as well. Um, I actually, it was a surprise to me to find out that actually we could eat parrotfish because I never thought we ate them. But, but for many people, it's actually their favorite fish. So um, I hope that people can find an alternative. Um, I remember in Europe when they had to ban cod because uh, because fish fingers are so so popular. So cod had to be banned, and people then substituted that with pollock. So. Uh, in terms of the Cayman reef fish, I think it's going to be very hard to substitute um, for those. Um, we might need to really go to the deep sea fish, which are not affected um, by this decline that we've been seeing. Um, and then I, I guess, guess this goes back to the, the whole issue as well, that we don't collect enough data. I, mean, I think the last time we did data in terms of our fish populations was in 2010. Um, and if we were really tracking this since like the 1950s, we would really see, I think, a massive decline, which would have probably, hopefully have prompted us to act a lot more sooner. But hopefully with the new government, we can create a more expansive marine park system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bernard. I believe one of the greatest risks to our environment is deforestation. That is the Wang Tong depletion of our mangroves and our wetlands. And this is caused from massive development. There is a plan by the present administration to take this population of this country to 100,000 people. We see the nightmare problems that we're now facing at roughly 65,000. Well, I actually think it's higher than that because a census was not done last year and one is done every 10 years. I was involved. I was one of the enumerators for the census in 2010. But I can tell you, having that amount of people on this island, on this country, will cause a lot of problems. The overdevelopment, as we can see, which is presently going on on the Seven Mile Beach corridors. If anyone has taken the time to go down by the Marriott, what used to be a beach, there's no more beach there. It has all been eroded. To walk where the beach was, you're actually above knee high in water. 
So I think one of the greatest tragedies is <laughs> developing, overdeveloping, and especially the depletion of our mangroves and our wetlands. Thank you. Mr. Taggart, same question, please. Thank you. In my view, the single largest, uh, you know, risk, highest risk to the Cayman Islands natural environment right now is climate change. It's an area which we need to come to grips with very quickly and understand what the risks are. Rising temperatures, rising sea levels, all play a, a very significant part in the whole ecology of the Cayman Islands. At the current rates, with the continuing rises in sea levels, it won't be very long before we get into a situation where a significant amount of our population and a, a amount of our landmass is going to be underwater. So I think as a country, we have to build smart. That means necessarily pulling things back further from the, the shoreline and to make sure that there is adequate elevation and when we build. And that, I think, will go a long way towards helping to, to, to alleviate that issue. The rising temp sea temperatures have, are, are a threat to our marine environment. It threatens our reefs. It threatens our marine species. And already you are seeing some of the effects of, of, of that in the destruction of corals and, and, and reefs worldwide because of the rising temperatures. So I think as a country, we are affected, I think, disproportionately because in terms of contributing to climate change, countries like Cayman don't make that much difference. There isn't that much of a contribution to the overall levels. But we certainly are affected in a much larger way by climate change um, because of the nature of the fact that we are an island and we are subject and prone to flooding in so many ways. Thank you. Dr. Mayfield, same question, please. Yes, I, I I also believe that climate change is the number one threat, and I think that people need to take it seriously. And um, the way that we are developing and the way that we are destroying the pr protections, natural protections that we had in terms of hurricane, and I always go back to the hurricanes that I was told about that when the water went across from Red Bay to the other side, so the two seas met. met. We're not building any sh um, hurricane shelters. You know, notice nobody's talking about hurricane shelters anymore, and the population is growing, and everybody's just casually there waiting for the disaster to come, and then everybody will panic, and the rich will get out, and the poor will drown. These are the kind of scenarios that we have to look at. Who is planning? Who is leading this country? <clears throat> and are they caring for the people? They're just leading the people, but they're not telling the people the truth. They're not telling the people that to, to be a civilized country, you must plan. And everybody must be involved, not just in receiving, but in giving. We have to have the equilibrium. We have to say, have to, have to, we have to have the same balance in the human ecology that we have in the natural ecology. And there are a lot of people thinking today about the natural ecology but nobody about the human ecology. We have broken families, we have broken <clears throat> communities, we have broken schools, we have broken government, we have broken everything. And we believe that everything is okay because our egos are fulfilled by all the materialism that costs, so much, costs us so much and we have to sell more and more and more. We have to get back to this whole thing that the risk that the environment has is equal to the risk which the human ecology has. They're both put together by God. And if we separate one and disregard one, the other one will retaliate. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Koo, please, same question. Thank you. I think the uh, candidates prior all established very good points on what they think the biggest risk to the environment is, and I don't disagree with any of them. I think if you look to the sort of root cause of why those issues are going to be issues for this country you have to look at governance and worldwide globally we're seeing governments not act in the best interests of their environment's futures um, well we've seen that here and that's something that really pushed me to run actually was my passion for the environment um, I think more environmentalists should be elected <laughs> you know mm -hmm. especially given the trajectory we need to look at going forward um, without good governance you can't have good planning Without good planning, you can't anticipate 
development and the effects that it'll have properly um, and take into account the quality of life that people will be experiencing with a lack of planning. Um, we've got a lot of developments that are going up that are polluting our environment as well, and they're not facing harsh enough penalties or they're not having enough deterrence in their way to incentivize them to keep the environment clean while they're developing. That's another big issue that we're seeing, especially as developments are slated to go up in the Georgetown East constituency. Um, you know, development also furthers flooding in the area. That's a, a massive issue that the constituency is also um, seeing. Um, the people before, they all, they mentioned climate change, and that's a huge issue. Sea level rise is going to affect us. Um, we are the 29th most vulnerable country in the world to sea level rise. Um, and as a flat coastal community, unless we do something urgently and immediately, we are really contributing to our own demise in that way. And so we need to use this downtime to imagine what we want our new normal to look like for the next 10, 20, 30 years and put our policies that have that vision for, lo for the long term to ensure our uh, sustainability long term. Thank you. <laughs> Question nine, and we'll start with you, Mr. Bernard. Okay. This one has to do with marijuana and decriminalization. Jamaica permits the use of cannabis for medical and religious purposes and decriminalized it in 2015. What would you would sorry, would you support a similar action for the Cayman Islands? My answer is I would support the decriminalization of marijuana for medicinal purposes only, not for just recreational purposes. It is an illegal drug in the Cayman Islands, and until we change that law, it should remain an illegal drug. We can see some of the effects. It is also a gateway drug. We see some of the effects of some of our people that use marijuana. We see some of the social problems that they have. They run around in the streets. They sleep in cars, they sleep on the streets, they beg at different venues, they become like a public nuisance. They offer jobs, they don't want to work because they can beg and make more money. That is a major problem. So I would support for medicinal purpose only, not just recreation. Thank you. Mr. McTaggart? Thank you, Shamari. I do support the decriminalization of, uh, of the marijuana use. Um, I think the use of it for medicinal purposes, I have no issue at all with it. Where the, criminali the, the, where the criminalization of marijuana usage has really harmed and hurt our society <laughs> is that when you are convicted, you have a criminal record. And I think that has prevented number of our Caymanians, young Caymanians in particular, from getting decent jobs, getting a tertiary education overseas because of criminal convictions. They are precluded from getting visas <coughs> and, and other things like this that, uh, that I, I think it is time for us to look at, uh, at decriminalizing the, the use of marijuana in, in Cayman. Um, I would want to know that it is something, as, as a leader, I would want to know that there would that the country would support the uh, that the there there is support there in the country for uh, for decriminalizing, and so whether that be by a referendum or by some other means, of the way of trying to determine what the country as a whole uh, would th their views with regard to it, I think that would have to be canvassed before taking the decision. But my personal view is that I would support the decriminalization. Thank you, sir, Doctor McPhee. Well, I actually. Um had that in my manifesto for 2013. And uh, of course, I support the decriminalization of marijuana. Um, I do not support the legalization of marijuana, which is a different thing, but decriminalization and education so that kids are educated to know what it is and whether or not to use it or not. There are a lot of people that use marijuana successfully, and not all of them are lazy. It doesn't make people lazy. What makes people lazy is the, their mind, the fact that they have that social orientation from the very beginning. 
So we have to think about that. There are a lot of people that drink a lot of alcohol and they, they work very hard. And some people drink alcohol and then just hang around and do nothing. So we have to look at the orientation of the people. Um, so the, the, this, this is the thing. We just don't do something or not do something without looking into how it affects different people. And that's the reason why you wouldn't say go legalize it and everybody goes smoking and it, it, it messes up some and some it don't mess up. It's a very careful <clears throat> um, sort of process. But you have to give people at some particular point the, the, the freedom to choo choose the way in which they enjoy their leisure if they're not going to be hurting people. I, I know we have big crack cocaine problems in this country. That, that's, that really destroys people, and we need to look into how we're going to deal with those points. But you can't connect the two, the marijuana and, 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 and the crack cocaine, in terms of the damage that is done, because the crack cocaine was actually developed to damage people uh, in America, and it's have done that successfully, not only in America, but a lot of other places as well. Thank you, sir. Ms. Deku? I do fully support the decriminalization of marijuana in Cayman. I recognize mm -hmm. that it does offer a lot of medicinal benefits for people, so I would champion that health insurance could cover uh, the medical cannabis available to patients locally. Um, I know that helps a lot of people, especially undergoing chemotherapy treatments. That's very helpful for them and other ailments, um, especially uh, mental health is, is, is a really positive um, outcome for people who use medical cannabis. Um, I, I would support um, educating the community absolutely on um, safely uh, using any drug or, or in marijuana in this case. Um, you know, there's, there's the aspect of it being, you know, I view it as a public health issue rather than as a criminal issue. Um, we need to understand the reasons why people might be self-medicating and get to the root cause, provide support for them to use, to, to cope in other ways, perhaps. Um, you know, when you criminalize it, you set people up for failure long term when it comes to employment. Um, so by decriminalizing it, we would have to very actively make sure that we're also expunging minor drug convictions relatively within a short time frame from decriminalizing it. Um, long term, I would support legalizing marijuana in Cayman. I think that it could become a really interesting industry in Cayman uh, to yep. cultivate it and to uh, potentially export it if we can um, cultivate enough here. And we could be a pioneer in the Caribbean regionally for that. Uh, I think that would be fantastic, especially, like I said, as we have to look forward to what we want our new normal to look like. Um, I think that despite the fact that it is my personal view that we should decriminalize marijuana, I would absolutely fully support consulting my constituents and holding a referendum to decide on the issue um, to see if the country as a whole wants this to be passed. Um, we have the uh, smoking laws in Cayman, so those would need to be absolutely taken into consideration as well. Um, you know, telling people you can't smoke in Thank public you. areas, that kind of thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Slop Rowlandson? Sure. Uh, I think we have to look at the issue of, um, at the issue that people are saying is a problem. Uh, I think people are saying that the problem is that children or young people with a record in marijuana use are not able to get employment. Um, and obviously there's a reason why employers don't want to employ <coughs> young adults who abuse marijuana. Um, so I think we need to sort of not kid ourselves um, that we are actually solving the problem that's, um, that exists in the island. Um, we do have a drug problem. Um, it's something that I wish we would take more seriously. Um, my mother was president of CASA, which was the Cayman Against Substance Abuse for seven years. And they had really successful programs for youth, um, encouraging them not to use drugs. Um, obviously, there is a distinction between CBD and THC. And apparently, the science has shown that the ratio of THC to CBD has increased um, quite significantly. So basically, the THC is responsible for the reward and the, and the highs and the addiction. Um, so, and that's actually um, what's what's can actually be harmful for the person. So that's gone up to like 80%, um, whereas the CBD portion is much lower. Um, certainly CBD in therapeutic doses in a regulated market helps a lot of conditions. There's research that supports that. But in terms of decriminalizing um, marijuana, I think 
we can't say that we're going to be led by the science for COVID and not be led by the science um, for marijuana. And there's not enough research to say that this is harmless. Um, we all know that drugs harm the brain. Um, certainly it affects memory and coordination. Um, if, you, if they're ill, they require much, much greater amounts of sedation if they're marijuana users. Um, it changes the size of their brain. Um, it affects maturity. So this is all uh, scientific research findings that really do um, indicate um, that this should not be a policy that a country should pursue. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. For the next question, uh, Mr. McTaggart, I'll address it first to you and focuses on the future of financial services. Given that financial services is critical to the island's economy, how do you think the country should respond to the FATF grey listing and the EU's intention to blacklist us, even though we have met most of their requirements? Mike, I think engagement and continued engagement with the EU is absolutely essential if we are to successfully negotiate this minefield. Turning our backs on the EU and playing hardball, I think we have seen, other countries have seen in the past, it does not work. So we must engage. Um, yes, right now we are on the, 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 the grey list, but it would appear to me, and the, the EU have indicated to us that they are going to be adding us to, to their high-risk high country, high country list, which is loosely defined as, as a blacklist. But we know that now know that that is not likely to take place until October. So we have an opportunity here now as a country to respond to the, to the three uh, recommendations or short fail, shortcomings that were identified in FATF review that, that took place a, a couple of years ago. We found that we were compliant with 61 of 64 um, comments and, and recommendations. And so the three all, all have to do with the enforcement mechanisms that we have to deal with money laundering, and other, you know, know your client violations uh, that, uh, and, and, you know, beneficial ownership uh, information that, that is required, companies are required to do in order to comply. And so we can focus now on that, knowing that, uh, um, that these are the areas that we have to, to, um, to address. But what is going to be extremely difficult is to really get any successful, you know, um, money laundering convictions uh, on the books by the time frame in which they have set. You just can't manufacture these things. It takes years to identify it and to probably get the evidence to bring it to a successful prosecution. So engagement for me is a key here to develop, to continue to work with the, uh, with the EU and to try and negotiate with them uh, when we come closer to that October date. Thank you. Dr. McField, same question, please. Well, uh, having a little bit better experience in terms of international intelligence and international relationships. I think that what happens in the Cayman Islands, a lot of people don't know, because I know the story going all the way back to the 1980s and how this thing developed, and the internal corruption in the Cayman Islands, even presently as we speak. Uh, the EU look at um, people and they say, oh, guys, we know what's going on there. You think we don't know what's going on there? You think we don't have some of our agents on the ground here? You guys are not supervising your system properly. And we told you that's what you're supposed to do. We have no, nothing, no, no disagreement with you earning money and some of our very wealthy people coming over there, having nice homes and call it their residency, but we have requirements. And so part of the problem is is that we have too many corrupt institutions locally. We have too many people that are working locally, that are working for profit, and they're not observing the laws and regulations as they should be, although they're there. We have a big problem with accountability in this country, not just in the government, but in the judiciary, in, in the banking system, in the accounting system, the legal system, and they, we need to face that. So every time we go there and we get off one list, we go back on another list, we go back on another list. Why do you think just because they want to destroy us, we need to face the music and clean up the act? And if we don't do it soon, there are going to be even more repression on us 
And so we just need to cooperate to a certain extent. Nobody's saying you have to turn over everything and give up everything, but cooperate. It'll be better. I can tell you that. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Koo, please. Financial services is an absolutely critical industry for the Cayman Islands um, and to ensure that our economy keeps flowing uh, 100 percent. I think that in order to address the EU uh, listing nations like ours and other small um, offshore jurisdictions and EU nations, that we should tackle the EU on a united front with these other similarly listed nations, um, present that we recognize that there are sort of double standards when it comes to how the EU is addressing um, people who are b being compliant with the requirements like ourselves to the you know extent that we can, you know, we, like um, pre other candidates alluded to, we cannot just make up convictions um, to meet the requirements of the EU. Um, that just, I think, goes to show that our rigorous AML procedures are exactly that. They're, they're very robust and good for our financial services industry. Um, like the question alludes to, we have met most of the requirements. Um, so going forward for the financial services um, industry, you know, I, I would champion on a slightly different note, making the financial services industry um, more socially and environmentally um, better, uh, positive for the economy as we look long term to how the financial services industry plays a role in climate change. Um, we are home to just about 75% of the world's funds who invest in climate change fueling industry. So that's something we could explore to ensure that our economy works for our people as well as our planet um, and putting those two factors over profit um, for our long-term sustainability. Thank you, Mrs. Lockroy-Robinson. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, following on from Mr. Koo, I mean, definitely um, Cayman is like one of the top um, administrators for pension funds. Um, and there's a lot of pressure on pension funds right now from their stakeholders and beneficiaries um, that they uh, comply and report on their environmental and social good governance. Um, so perhaps there's an opportunity for the Cayman Islands to assist pension funds um, with that reporting, because um, that would certainly be aiding in the development of more transparency and a, a better functioning financial services sector for the world. Um, certainly, I think it's quite hard to keep up with all the lists that we end up being put on. I actually uh, spoke to somebody recently and it was actually four or, or four or five different lists. Um, so I do believe that we need to be more proactive and much more responsive, um, and, but also highlight the facts um, that we are complying so much on these indicators. Um, we're doing far better, in fact, compared to the UK and the US. Uh, so there really does need to be a level playing field. In terms of some of the other solutions I propose, I really do feel that we need to set up a new entity that's conflict-free. It's very hard for an organization such as Cayman Finance. They do a terrific job, but it's very hard for them to get the credibility to um, present the se sector because they're obviously protecting their business. So we need somebody who's conflict-free um, and even somebody objective apart from the government as well. And for this group to be very involved in in constant engagement with a lot of the leading UK and European and US authorities so that we're always on the table. We're not just on the table when something bad happens. We need to be part of the solution. Um, and certainly there's a lot of illicit finance, even over the COVID pandemic. Um, there's a lot of online fraud that people are concerned about. So certainly Cayman uh, needs to be a part of um, making the world a safer place financially. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Bernard, uh -huh. please. Financial services is the number one revenue generator for the Cayman Islands. The fundamental problem that we have in this country is we do not have control of it. Because we are an overseas territory, we are dictated to by the UK. So for us to negotiate with FATCA, we don't have our own people doing that negotiating. People who are representatives of our government has to meet with the UK representatives and they put forward our proposals. However, we often see what the outcome of that is. The UK always takes the lead. So we are not in control. We'll always be playing catch-up. Thank you. Thank you.
Can I rebut? Mm-hmm. No. On your next two minutes, if you'd okay. like. I have the pleasure of asking the last question of this round, and I'll start with you, Dr. McField. And it's interesting. I have a fantasy football league, and a gentleman from Randyke named his team the Randyke Floodouts. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that says it all. Um, so this actually has to do with Randyke Gardens and flooding. And as you mentioned, I'm sure it's not a two-minute conversation, but let's give it our best. <laughs> What do you plan to do to address the ongoing flooding that impacts the Randyke Gardens development? Well, I would like to look at how to use the water uh, that is accumulated there because water is a very valuable asset. And um, we are always looking for water to recycle, and I don't see why we couldn't put it drain it in such a way that it could be recycled and reused. And I had this little funny idea that Mr. Barnes has a piece of land there that he had intended to put his buses and his lots of, of, of space there where he could set up some little gardens and start some gardening, some vegetables, so everybody would have a little piece, like how they used to do in England in the old times, where everybody had their little plots, the working people had their little plots. And I thought we could use water there too. But if we are going to use agriculture in the Cayman Islands, we can use water. So we need to be thinking about how to use all this water that's doing the, the flooding. Now, they, they have very uh, clever ways of using water in, 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 in Miami and where they have a lot of low land in those areas in America. So we, I would have to have the resources to actually do the best investigation or I, at least I would set my people to work in terms of finding creative ways to be able to solve this type of problem that Randyke is involved with. But I think that Randyke could be turned into a gentrified community without the poorer class of people actually losing their community because the community is very important. So I'm looking at creative solutions for that particular spot. Thank you. Ms. Deku? Yes, I think that in order to address the ongoing flooding that impacts Randyke, especially within Georgetown East, um, is to assess the developments going up around that neighborhood to ensure that the effects of the development are not felt negatively by the residents of Randyke, especially when it comes to flooding and stormwater drainage. So ensuring that stormwater drainage is built to be current with the developments in the area so that they full, are fully functioning, they're cleaned regularly, We're, we take the proactive approach to ensure that they're kept clean, um, you know, whenever we have a rainy season or what have you, ensuring that um, perhaps roadworks were not, um, did not run off into the drains and clog them, which, which has happened. Um, when building developments around that area, because it's already such a low-lying area due to the mangrove forest within the South Sound Basin, um, I think it's a good opportunity to explore different types of architectural engineering. So perhaps building on stilts around the area, exploring that route rather than deforesting. You're kind of maintaining the forest underneath the buildings themselves. Um, we could have probably like a funky nature walk, boardwalk throughout the South Sound Basin that connects these developments. Um, that could be cool. But to really long term look at how we would address the flooding, definitely we need to take into consideration the developments going up around the area. Um, something that I would be championing within my first 100 days of office is electing a district advisory council. And part of their role would be to form a neighborhood area development plan to take into consideration the long term future of the constituency of Georgetown East, what developments we want to go up, what needs need to be met that can be maintained within the community, um, what goods could be. Um, you know, good services and uh, businesses could go up within the area and planning to ensure that it's a community um, that doesn't negatively affect as it's being developed. Thank you. Ms. Hislop Rollinson? Mm, sure, thanks for the question. Uh, certainly, I think this is actually a national issue, so we should not try to um, condense it just down to Randyke Gardens. I think we need to look at it on a national scale. Um, we need a, a watershed plan um, with building of culverts and drainage um, systems. Uh, we need a task force, I think, to look at this issue as well um, as a priority. Um, you know, storm season comes by, comes around so so quickly. We need to really secure this um, neighborhood um, to protect them from future um, storms. Um, certainly, I think the development around that area needs to be um, 
looked at more carefully. Um, we've got the central planning authority, but um, you know, we need probably a change in in the membership of, of that CPA. Um, a lot of people have been very long-standing members, um, but we do need um, some more accountability in terms of what developments are allowed um, in that area and other areas in Cayman. Um, so certainly. I think flooding is going to be a number one issue and there are definitely solutions out there. I think we have to be very positive and um, make the investments that we need to. And um, I, I do believe that the policy of the government in terms of buying very cheap land, which is flood prone, to build low cost housing is, um, is not um, necessarily a good strategy because um, I feel that, that will just increase costs downstream. So. Perhaps we could ask um, DART um, to help us with low-cost housing. Um, I think we definitely need to be able to look at um, getting a plan in place to um, house people that can't afford to to buy a house in Cayman that costs three hundred thousand um, dollars. Not that they're available either, but we certainly need to um, look at this issue with urgency. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. <coughs> Flooding is a major problem in the Randag area. This is the number one problem. And for a long time, the problem has been ignored by successive governments. The can has just been kicked down the road. People have been given the opportunity to go in there buy homes and buy property, starting homes, only to not be told that there is a structural problem. The land is low. So before you start to build, you need to build up on the land. And this is something that I think is partly a fault of planning, because why would you go and give permission for houses to be built on a low-lying area that is prone to flooding, just simple rains, and the foundation is three and four inches from the ground? That is, yep. just makes no sense. I would do a comprehensive study through engineers. And that also would be commissioned through the district council or advisory council. Because as I mentioned before, the district Ad advisory council, they would be the lays between the representative and the people. So for me, that would be the way to go. Thank you. Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. Um, I spent two hours yesterday in Randai with a roads engineer from the NRA. Looking at the issues that exist down in there, they are long-standing, as we have said, more than 30 years old, and no one has yet been able to solve it completely. What I found when I was there yesterday is that there are a number of drainage wells that have been placed in the Randyke -like area along the roads and in the sides and verges of roads to provide drainage during the, um, during the, the rainy season. But what's happened is a lot of those drainages are no longer functioning. They are, they basically have collapsed and are not functioning. And that was contributing directly to the, um, to exacerbating the problem that exists. Two, three years ago, I arranged that we had more than a dozen new wells, deep wells drilled, drilled in that area. And they have really worked to, to help to, with the runoff and the drainage of water in the area. But what exists, even with, with expanding that, cannot cope with the significant amount of rain that, that, and water that collects when you have any, any levels, significant levels of rainfall. It builds up very quickly. But I think that with the, uh, getting these, these drainages cleared and functioning once again, it will go some way towards alleviating the issue. Longer term, we have to find a way to, to move the water that's, that, that it, that's dumped onto the roads down to the back of Randyke into the... Um, into the, the mangroves, which then empty out into into the um, into the south sound through the culverts, and that's another issue that that uh, that that 
you know, the only way to get rid of these large bodies of water are to open that culvert and allow the water to flow through into, into the South Sound. But that presents a whole host of other issues for the residents of, of, George, of, of South Sound. But at the moment, it's the only option that we have until a long-term solution can be found. Thank you, sir. Two rounds of questions. Thanks, candidates. We're going to take another short commercial break. When we return, we'll decide whether we have a couple more questions in store. <laughs> Please stay tuned. March in Cayman is hot, but at Foster's, it's frozen. Frozen Food Month is back, and we're giving away four $250 Foster's cards to win or just purchase any three products from the Frozen Department from now until March 27th. It's that easy. You could grab a frozen pizza for dinner, frozen berries for a morning smoothie, and frozen plant-based sausages for something different. Exactly. Just don't forget to enter online at fosters.ky slash frozen food month. Foster's, better because we care. the Cayman Islands, the private sector is the prosperity engine that drives the country forward. Just like a real engine. The better we understand how it works, the better we can make it run, and the better off we'll be. To help illustrate how our economy works, let's take a step back in time to when there were only a few thousand people living in Cayman. In those days, most people survived by fishing or farming for food. It was a simple, wholesome life. But it was a lot of hard work. Most people bought what...
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for George, Georgetown East. We've reached that stage this evening where we're going to go to closing statements. And we'll begin with how the candidates were seated this evening. We'll begin with Emily Deku. Thank you, Will. And I'd like to thank the Chamber as well for providing me with this platform to share my vision and goals for Cayman um, in, t in anticipation of the upcoming election on April 14th. Cynicism in our community has become the response to poor representation. So I'm here to give you, the voters of GTE, an option for a candidate that is inspiring and who genuinely cares to ensure you are fully represented in Parliament. We have a moral generational obligation to do our best to secure our youth's futures and to support and inspire all of our people to succeed in society. Georgetown East, its residents and the environment, need an advocate within government who is a proponent of participatory democracy, it needs keen representation, and it needs sustainable development. On April 14th, Georgetown East, I ask you to give independent candidates like me your vote. Independent candidates like me who will work hard to bring Cayman into the 21st century. Your vote is a vote for the voiceless and is a vote for the community being listened to and represented and respected fully, with good governance and transparency being non-negotiables. Many of you may not know me, but I can relate to many of you, and I want to represent you. I may not have the experience of the fellow candidates, but I will competently serve you because my qualifications go beyond what are on paper. Empathy, vision, dedication, and integrity. <coughs> Whilst I do acknowledge that I am one of the younger candidates, everyone in government had a first time in office. Everyone had to start somewhere. And it started, and they started with being entrusted with the electorate's faith that they would succeed. The planet, our children, and the vulnerable members of our community are asking for that same faith from you by asking you to elect me on April 14th. I am Emily Deku. I represent positive change in Caymanian leadership. I understand the grimness that many families in Cayman face. I understand the importance of sustainable development, and I am not in the business of lying to you or making promises that I don't intend to keep. Georgetown East, on April 14th, please vote for change. Please vote number two, Emily Deku. Thank you. Christina Hislop Rawlinson. Mm -hmm. Get it right. <laughs> Yeah. So I would uh, certainly implore uh, the voters to um, look at what the candidates all stand for, the principles they stand for. Um, certainly you want a candidate that's uh, interested in good governance, uh, whether that be with dealing with the environment or with society. Um, certainly I stand for the Constitution um, and upholding those uh, the, those values and provisions um, and I stand for education and improving attainment um, for our young children uh, I stand for the environment um, and I certainly would not be interested in selling Cayman out which is um, one of the one of the main concerns of of the constituents as a whole um, I have recently been been endorsed by the Christian Association of Civ Civics um, because of my um, of what I stand for. Um, so I do implore the voters who don't know some of the newer candidates to, um, to, you know, to become better acquainted with the principles that they're standing for. Um, I'm having a meeting tomorrow night um, at the Seafarers Hall at 7 p.m. And certainly everybody is welcome to attend. It will be live streamed on Facebook and um, Instagram. I'm holding the meeting along with uh, a prospect uh, candidate, uh, Michael Miles. And we will be having some special guests as well um, to, to bring solutions to the problems that, that have been accumulating over the last um, decade. Um, what was I going to say? So I'm very pleased to see some new candidates uh, this election season. Uh, many, many young adults in their prime, as well as are the older and wiser. And I'm very pleased to see more women. Um, women contribute different optics to governance. Um, they tend to have a, a greater focus on family life and community life. 
And I think that there we have had a deficit in that um, topic uh, for some time now. So I really do hope that we will encourage more women to um, take on leadership roles and to form the policies and form the new legislations that will um, hold us and keep us secure as a nation. Um, certainly, I'm, enjoy I'm looking forward to talking to the youth ambassadors on Thursday morning. I was unable to attend their forum at the Cayman International School on the weekend um, due to an emergency. Um, however, I will be doing a Zoom meeting with them on Thursday. So I'm really looking forward to talking to them about environmental issues, um, including the new... Uh, landfill waste energy plant. Um, it's very important in the 21st century that we um, pursue the circular economy. And I feel that that plan um, is not congruent with, with that. So I look forward to, um, and I just wanted to also say thank you very much for the Chamber for organizing this. I hope that it'll inspire other organizations to do the same next time. So, yeah. Mr. Richard Bernard. Mm -hmm. You, the voting public of Georgetown East, and the wider voting public of the Cayman Islands. This is your time. This is time for you to make a change, a positive change, a change that you can say, my life is better. My situation is different. Do not allow yourself to be hostages of decisions made by people who don't care about you. And then come election time, they run up to your door, wanting to shake your hands and hand you out a handout. People of Georgetown East, you know the problems you face. You've seen the candidates and what they stand for, what they support, and some of their solutions. Let me tell you, the Cayman dream has become a Cayman nightmare. And it takes each and every one of you to change that comes April 14th. We can do that together. So I'm asking you, the voting public of Georgetown East, to give me your vote, Richard Bernard, number one on the ballot, and let's do it together. We can make those changes. They are needed and they must happen, but it all begins with you. Mr. Roy McTaggart. Thank you, Will, Mike, Shamari, all the staff of the chamber for hosting these forums that are now really a regular and permanent fixture of the general election seasons. I am honored to have served as Minister for Finance and Economic Development these past four years. I believe that the people of Cayman have seen and experienced the benefits of my strong leadership and adherence to the principles of fiscal prudence in managing the financial affairs of this country and leading us through this pandemic. In seeking re-election to, to Parliament on April 14, Tonight, I'm proud to stand on my record. There are no other candidates tonight with a comparable track record. My 30 years of ex working in the financial services industry has given me the knowledge, the skills, and the experience that is needed in government today. Managing a billion dollar annual budget and a $4 billion economy is not a job for unqualified or inexperienced. Cayman faces several significant challenges going forward. I remind everyone tonight that we are still in the midst of the global pandemic, not despite, despite the fact that we are operating quite normally in our own bubble. We are also dealing with EU regulations that constantly see a moving goalpost and continue to threaten the very existence of the financial services industry. We have to sensibly reopen our borders, and jumpstart our tourism economy and the hospitality sector. We need to continue to manage our domestic needs so that no one gets left behind, raise our educational standards, upgrade our infrastructure, 
and do all this by not only being environmentally conscious and responsible, but to try and do this without having to borrow further money, but borrow money. That's a very tall order to fulfill, but one I believe is, is, is achievable. I assure you that I am more than ready to take on the leadership role in the next government. I am confident that you, the voters, will recognize that the route to continued stability, safety, and prosperity for this country is to elect the Progressives Alliance, who will be and who will hit the ground running on, from day one. It has been my honor and privilege to serve you, the people of Georgetown East, and I ask for your continuing support by re-electing me to Parliament on April 14th. Thank you, and God bless these beautiful Cayman Islands. Dr. Frank McPhail. Yes, uh, people of Georgetown East, I brought two copies of my book, Time Longer Than Rope, here tonight. One is to present to Mr. Will Penu, and the other one to a gentleman here, Mike. And it, it tells the story, Time Longer Than Rope. We're in this situation because people would not allow you to listen to me. All those many years ago, this book has been published. These books have been published since 96. They're not in your schools. This is a history book for the Cayman Islands. Look how big it is. It's not in your school. I bet Mr. McTaggart has not read this book. Here it is. And all the work that has been done to prepare our society to be able to know itself and therefore know where it's going and nothing has been done to implement these strategies in our schools. We have a confused society and everybody wants to do everything and everybody wants to go in their own way. But Georgetown East can make a big difference by giving the Cayman Islands a leader in these serious times that really care about people that have suffered in this country for bringing the truth. Mr. McTaggart is a magician. He just did some magic there. He just said all his years of experience. I am more experienced in government than him. I was a minister of government. I accomplished many things. He's talking about finance. I'm talking about people. Of course, you need finance if you have people. But we can create this and we can preserve what we have. But we do not have to destroy our environment, our human environment, and our social environment and our physical environment, broken homes, broken families, broken communities, and a broken political system, who've done it. Those people who have refused to listen to their history, to listen to people like myself, who are offering poorer people help, help to pull them up. And these people are pushing them down and ignoring them. And when election time comes, they come by and say, we're gonna solve your problem. Don't buy it this time. Vote for a change. And I hope that that person that you vote for is number four on the ballot. He's sitting in number four seat. I'm number five because we're going to switch it on April the 14th. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. This is a prophecy. I'd like to thank the candidates uh, for our final forum. Thank you very much. It was a lively discussion. I'm now going to turn it over to the president of the chamber, Mr. Michael Gibbs, for closing remarks. We finish with a smile. That's good. Uh, on behalf of the Chamber Council and staff, I'd like to thank the Georgetown East candidates, Richard Bernard, Emily Deku, Frank McField, Roy McTaggart, and Christina hislop Rollinson for participating in this evening's forum. And I trust that the forum will help the voters in that constituency to determine who to vote for when you go to the polls on April the 14th. I'd also like to thank Fosters for their major sponsorship of the Chamber's candidate forums, as well as Affinity Recruitment, Bodden's Legal and Corporate, and DART. If you're interested in viewing more of the Growth Matters video series that have been playing during tonight's commercial breaks, they can be accessed at growthmatters.ky. Tonight is the last of the 19 chair forums that the Chamber has organized for this year's general election. And as mentioned earlier this evening, if you have missed any of the forums, you can visit the Chamber's YouTube channel to view them again. In closing, on behalf of the Chamber Council and staff, I would like to once again thank all the candidates 
who accepted our invitation to appear in these forums. And we sincerely hope that these forums have been helpful to voters as they decide which candidates should be elected to lead the Cayman Islands over the next four years. One other plug, the, Chayman, uh, the Chamber's annual Earth Day cleanup takes place on Saturday morning, uh, the 24th of April. We're inviting residents from the various constituencies, as well as businesses and organizations, to sign up and adopt a cleanup area, either in your community or along a beach. Volunteers who register early will receive a free Guy Harvey designed t-shirt, reusable tote bag, and cleanup supplies while supplies last. There will also be a free brunch for volunteers following the cleanup. So register online at thecaymanchamber.ky and I hope to see you all at the event. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Good night.